Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, it's still 15 minutes of morning left. Those of you who know, you know, when I, when I have one of these on, usually I'm the guy that's going to be speaking that day. So I need to start wearing one of these more often. I like wearing ties. I just got to get more shirts that fit me now. So I was supposed to speak a few weeks back, but uh, I got bumped when uh, Brother Ken Walker came. But that's a good thing. Uh, because for those of you who know, if you call me during the week and I'm on the road a lot, I'm generally driving. I mean, you can anytime you call me, you pretty much, what are you doing? I'm, I'm driving. <laughs> Bondle catches me, Kenan catches me. I'm driving all the time. So all that windshield time gives me plenty of time to listen to my radio. And uh, I have satellite radio, so it's just like cable, 600 channels, and I listen to two. Um, and uh, one of them is Christian radio and the other one is talk, talk radio. So I say it's a good thing I was bumped because this last week I've been putting together my thoughts on this message for a little while now and uh, last week I heard a story that was on one of the talk radio shows that fit in very well with what I was trying to complete my thoughts with and so I'm going to start this off with this. It was a story that an older woman was telling and uh, she was telling about her, her childhood. She was, she was German, and she grew up in Germany during the time of when the Nazis were coming into power and really starting to oppress the Jewish people there. Um, and it was at this time that she was re re recollecting the story. Uh, the oppression was very severe. Um, the standing orders or the law of the land, so to speak, was that you were not to give any aid at all to the Jewish people. No, no aid, no comfort. And you, weren't even really supposed to acknowledge their existence if you were one of the just German citizens. Um, don't provide any opportunities for work. No, don't buy their products if they have a shop. Don't sell to them if you don't have to. Uh, no clothing, no bedding, no shelter, no food, nothing. Uh, before they started really pushing toward the concentration camps, when rounding up all the Jewish people, they, they were basically trying to purge the Jews from existence while they were still walking amongst them, almost like uh, what some people would hear about, like, uh, like an Amish shunning. I mean, they're right there, but you're not allowed to see them. Um, they walked amongst the German population. They were to be completely ignored. Germans were not to interact with the Jews, and the Jews were forbidden to interact with the German citizens or even talk to them under penalty of arrest, imprisonment, and as time went on, even death. So she was recollecting that, you know, the winter was coming on and this treatment had been building up and, and as winter sets in, it's, it's bitter cold in Germany during winter time. And uh, they were very desperate for just the basics of life at this point, the clothes, shelter, and food. So this young German lady was on her way home from school one day and a small Jewish girl came running out latched onto her and just begged her for food. Now this was right in the middle of the day where anybody could see German citizens or could tell the Nazi soldiers that, hey, these two are interacting. That was just as bad for the German citizen as it was for the Jew. She had nothing. She was coming home from school. She'd already eaten her lunch. She had nothing to give this child, but she looked down at this child and she said, at that instant, she knew she had to do something. So she told the little girl, meet me around the corner tomorrow, this time, I will bring you some food. She remembers that she was about 16 when she told this little girl that. So she went home that evening and she sat there at, her, at the table with her parents. All was quiet. And at this time she remembered that when, this, when the Nazis came into power, we sit around a table with our family and we laugh and we joke and we talk about the day's events and we talk about what's coming up and what things. Even the German citizens, they had their, their tables were quiet. They sat there. They were resolute. They just didn't talk about anything. So she couldn't really even hardly eat her dinner. When she finally spoke, it was, with, uh, it was very quiet, but it was resolved. She simply said, I met a starving Jewish girl today. I told her that tomorrow I was going to bring her something to eat. 
And with that, she wrapped up her small loaf of bread and cheese in a napkin and just sat there at the table. It was obvious to her parents that there was no talking her out of her plans. Everyone knew what could happen if she was caught. Her father sat there with a concerned and worried expression for a bit. Her mother, completely silent, just stared down at her own plate of food. No one spoke for a few more minutes. Finally, the parents looked at each other. And the father gave a nod to the wife, and the mother got up, went to the cupboard, opened it up, grabbed a great big pot, set it on the stove, and as she did that, all she said was, Ich bin sicher, sie wird Freunde. Which simply says, I'll, uh, I imagine she'll have friends. This story has so many parts and pieces to it, but I wanted to focus on the main thread that really resonated with me. Why did this young lady do this for the Jewish girl? I mean, obviously, c compassion, sympathy, maybe even a, a tinge of guilt in there for what she has and the others don't. I'm sure these are all possible motivations, but there was something else, something that put action to those feelings. What did she have that helped her do this in the face of being caught? She had courage. Courage to stand up, do what she needed to do. Now, the dictionary definition of courage is the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain, etc without fear, or in other words, bravery. Now she was definitely facing danger by doing this act that she was about to do. She knew what could happen and made the conscious choice to do the right thing. She said, and when she was re retelling the story, she said that when she looked at that girl in her eyes, a verse came into her mind immediately, and we all know what it is, the golden rule. It's Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. She was, they were living under a different law that the Nazis had given them. Don't interact with those people. Don't do it. She was now acting upon a higher law. She would want someone to give her something to eat if she was that little girl. So the right thing for her to do was at that very moment, minimum give that child some food. So as I was listening to the retelling of the story, a verse came to my mind, and it's in, found in James 2, 14 through 18. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And also at the end of that same chapter, James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. The fact that she said that the golden rule came to her mind uh, tells me that she had a conviction of her faith at that moment. It also tells me that her parents did a pretty good job. I mean, she was a young girl, and she had the scripture given to her, obviously, because it came to her mind. She'd been brought up with scripture. But what good is having faith at that instant going to accomplish if she didn't actually do something? Faith requires works. Another word for it is action. She was being called upon to put her faith into action. Despite the risk, danger, possible repercussions, she had to do something. She now had to act on her faith with courage that comes from none other than our Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I think that's exactly what she was doing. She was being brave. She had to be strong to do what she was going to do. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. She had to be a strong individual, but where did that strength come from? Well, Isaiah 4, 41.10 tells us, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
This last verse points to another part of the key of the definition of courage that I read to you. The fear not, it says in Isaiah, well, the definition said without fear. The concept of courage in the Bible many times has a direct order attached to it. Do not fear, be not afraid, take heart, do not be anxious. In every case, there is always a reason to give or given to have this courage that you're required to have. And it's the same reason over and over and over again. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's a long way of putting it. Romans 8, a part of Roma, a verse in Romans 8, we know this one. If God is for us, who can be against us? Courage should be very easy with that in mind. We should be, it, knowing that God is with us, if we, if we lean upon him, courage should come readily to us. If we trust in the Lord, and not on our own understanding, but many times, courage is not easy. It was not an easy choice to make for so many of the other Germans at that time. The courage of our convictions is not easy for many of us today in our everyday lives. There's so many people that are out there that, you know, they slippery slope a little bit here, a little bit there, and pretty soon they've lost their own convictions. They don't know where they're at. But even that, we, and we do not even face that same level of, of danger that they did then in Germany or others around the world today do for their faith in Christ. We've got so many stories in the news that, uh, you know, courage here is, you know, standing up and stating what you believe and, you know, possibly losing your financial livelihood for it. Well, courage in, in Kenya was standing up and saying, yes, I'm a Christian, and then they were shot. Sure, everyone likes to talk a big game. When nothing is really on the line, we all like to think that we have the courage of lions. Yeah, I, I, I can do that, I'll do that. Peter is a good example of the same thing. We just had our Lord's Supper service the other night, and in that story, after they finished, they were sitting around, and, and, and Peter, during that story, says, you know, Jesus says, where I go, you can't go with me. And Peter says, I'll go anywhere. I'll die for you. He was, in that small, enclosed setting, amongst his friends and peers, he was verbally ready to give up his life. Jesus said, uh-uh, you're going to deny me three times. When Peter was put to the test, he denied him. And when the pressure was really on, Proverbs 24.10 for him basically says it for me. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Because you've depended on your own understanding. You've depended on your own knowledge, your own base of, of whatever it is that gives you strength. You didn't depend on the Lord. The Lord's strength is infinite. If I, being a Christian go out there and can't stand up for what I believe, the Lord didn't fail that. I failed the Lord on that. Yes, it's hard to do. Harder in some places than others. A couple other uh, examples of courageous people in the Bible. Noah. Here's a man who's building a big, big boat in the middle of a desert. <laughs> he was, and it took a long time, and he was being ridiculed the whole time for it. You can just imagine the things that he had to endure while he was building this massive construction project. But he did it, and he kept doing it. That took courage of his faith. Esther. There was a courageous lady right there. She asked for them to pray with her and fast with her, and that the next she was going to go in there, even though it could mean that she'd be killed, because you didn't go in front of him without being invited. But she was going to do it anyways, and she did it. She said she was going to do it. That would be where Peter was. I'm good. I, I laid down my life for you. She went through with it. Courage. David and Goliath. 
David had all the courage in the world. He knew God was on his side. What's wrong with you guys? David, God's on my side. I'm going to go out there. Come on. He went out there with the faith in God, and God carried him through. All the apostles. I mean, this man walks up, says, stop what you're doing and follow me. They sent something there. They gave it up, followed him. Now, Paul and this woman's story have, a, have something else in common. Uh, courage is contagious. The young woman in, her, uh, in the story, she had courage to, first off, even talk to the Jewish girl. But then she went home, and she still had to tell her parents what she was planning on doing. She sat there. She finally announced it, did her action of folding up her bread and her cheese and ready to give it. What happened then? Did the parents fly off the handle? Were they trying to stop her? No. This young girl's courage moved her parents to help. Her courage strengthened them to do the right thing. Paul has the same situation. He, is, uh, he has his followers, and they're, they're down, they've been traveling in, in Acts 21, verses 10 through 15. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, I'm going to stop right there for a second. <laughs> he just took the belt off of the man who owned the belt. <laughs> they knew him as a prophet. He comes in, he makes, he makes this proclamation. Paul was ready. Paul, they all knew what it meant because right here now it says, now when we heard these things, now this is Luke, when we heard these things, we bo both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. A prophet came, delivered a message. Paul accepted that and said, All right, I'm ready, let's go. Courage. Now where it gets where he where, where the courage is contagious is right, right here. So when, we, when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain menacing of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. So not only did they, did his simple act of courage of stating, Why are you doing this? I'm going to go there and I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to die. That act of courage helped them see God's will and motivated them to pack up and go with him. Here, just a bit before, they were saying, let's not go, don't go. Now they're going along with him. The last thing about uh, courage is that as followers of Christ, we are all called to be courageous. 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 8. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. He's in prison. He's suffering. His courage is inviting you to partake with that. The definition I had read earlier, danger, pain, bravery. If we never have to depend on the strength of the Lord to be courageous, if we never step out of our own little worlds or comfort zones, if we are never in a situation where we are feeling the pull to do the right thing, even when the world is saying something different, then we are not putting action to our faith. 
We are keeping the light of Jesus covered up while we hide under the basket or stick our heads in the sand. We're to be brave. We're to let our light shine forth into this ever-darkening world. We're to be bold. Let others see our little light, that they will be encouraged and shine their light with us. We're to be courageous. God bless you.